service. So what I'm going to do now is share my screen with you. If I can do that, let's see here. Get some slides going. Let's see if that will share. All right. All right. So there's the websites. If you didn't get those, um, I did prepare two pages of notes, and we're going to talk a little bit of, about those. I'm going to introduce them here in the beginning, but then we'll sort of go over it at the end of this little session. But that's the picture of my little book. You can buy it at Amazon.com. It's from a series of books by a, a variety of different authors. And they're all booklets. They're just meant to be introduct introductory type of booklets that you can give away or use if you're a beginner. And that's what my little book is about. It is definitely for beginners on the new moon. And the second half actually takes you through each of those Hebrew months. And we're gonna go through one month. We're gonna do a sample. And that is for this upcoming month that starts this next uh, weekend, Heshvan, the eighth biblical month. And so you're going to get a taste of some of what you see in the book, and some of what we're going to go over is more advanced than what I even have in the booklet. But in the documents or in the notes, whether you're looking on Facebook or you've got the email uh, from the wonderful ladies at the Rooted Cafe, uh, one of those is called Boundary Stones. And if you read through that, it's a couple little pages, and that is something that I developed for groups just based on our experience of being mindful and purposeful coming together to celebrate the new moon because our primary focus at our meetings is prayer. They are prayer meetings. Uh, we do fellowship, we eat, uh, sometimes we dance, we worship, we do lots of different things. Sometimes we'll do a, a small teaching, but the primary focus is prayer because this is an appointed time, the beginning of the months are. And so, um, on the back of the boundary stones, or on the second page, there is an acronym just for new moon. And we often will read that at the beginning of our meetings, particularly if we have new people that are joining us. Uh, and we have them come you know, from lots of different walks of life, a lot of them from the church. And uh, sometimes they're leery to come because the, you know, celebrating the new moon sounds a little witchy to people. But it's not. It's definitely biblical. It is in the Torah throughout the prophets, and it's definitely also in the New Testament. Uh, so we, we have the, that acronym put there so that everyone has an idea of the expectations of the meeting. Because at these meetings, this is not the place to debate doctrine. It's not the place to push an agenda. It's not to bring your business to sell and to promote. That's not what the new meetings were about. In fact, if you go into Nehemiah or Nehemiah and Ezra and you're reading about when they were coming back together to Jerusalem and, and they built the wall and their house and when they were beginning to celebrate, you see that they definitely shut those gates, not just on Shabbat, but on the new moon. So the commerce was not supposed to go on then. So what we do is we worship and, and bless the creator of the universe and we minister to one another and we pray. And that should be the focus. And those gates, those windows of heaven are definitely open just like they are on Shabbat and on the other Moedim. So of course we do try to cite the new moon, we blow shofars, and, and we do have a very good time doing that. It's not just some solemn, completely solemn thing. Of we, we enjoy ourselves with the Lord when we do that. Now the second thing that I gave you was a, a month sheet it's going to have the primary points of Heshvan, and some of them may seem mystical to you, or you're like, I don't know about this, but we're going to go over it. I'm going to tell you where they come from. And on the back of that one, there's a general blessing for the month that you can use any month, if you're just celebrating alone, or with your family, or over Zoom, or with a group, a mixed group with families, or if it's a women's meeting, however you decide to do it, there's a blessing there for you. And there's also what I call the cheat sheet of the months. And that chart just has the traditional, the Jewish traditional traits that they associate with the months. And that may, um, there may be a lot of points on there that you don't quite understand, but we're going to go through some of that, especially when we do um, the sample for the month, hash font that's coming up. So first, we are going to do just an introduction. Where's the first mention of the moon? And that would be on day four of creation, 
is Genesis chapter 1, where God gave those heavenly luminaries. Now, the moon is not called the moon in this case. It's called the lesser light, and it governs the night. But all the luminaries have a type of governing aspect to them. And they are heavenly governors. They are like Adonai's calendar and clock in the sky. The problem is, as humans, and we see this throughout history, is that a lot of people, rather than recognizing them for what they are, that they're governors over the calendar, they're not governors over your life, uh, they end up worshiping these luminaries, whether it's the sun, moon, and stars, or all three. And that's not what we're doing when we're celebrating the new moon, of course. We are recognizing the creator of these luminaries and their purpose and how wonderful it is that the heavens truly do declare the glory of Adonai. And they have a voice that speaks day into day. We're going to look at that scripture here in just a minute. But based on that passage, passage in Genesis that we just looked at, on day four of creation, um, Adonai gives the purpose for these lights. And notice there's verbs here. As Brenda was saying in her session, you know, Hebrew is a very action-oriented language. And so what these luminaries do is they separate the day from the night. Now, as I read through these, I want you to think definitely in the literal. We know that they separate the day and the night, but also think about these terms in a very figurative or spiritual aspect because it's just as true. They separate day and night. They are for signs, seasons, days, and years. They give light to the earth. True heavenly luminaries don't take, they give. And they govern the day and the night, and they separate the light from the darkness. So there is an aspect to the luminaries, including the moon, that brings a separation of light from the darkness. And we know that the stars and the moon actually are lights in the darkness, but there's a mirror effect, a parable effect, that if we're following his calendar, that we are doing these same sorts of things. So in their role, as that heavenly clock or calendar in the sky, what they're really doing is governing our time. Adonai is deeply concerned about what we do with our time. And if you are following his calendar, if you're doing the weekly Shabbat and you're doing the, the yearly festivals and you decide also now to do the new moons, let me tell you, your calendar is full. There's lots of schedules on there for us to uh, appointments for us to meet him. And by doing so, you don't have a lot of time to get in trouble because there's lots of preparation involved with all of these. And this is a good thing. It busies us with the things of the kingdom rather than just the things of the world. And I know we have things in the world we have to deal with, but our primary focus should be these light posts every week, every month, and in the yearly cycle, and even beyond, you know, that cycle gets much larger with the Shemitah cycle, the seven-year cycles, and in the larger 50-year cycles, the Jubilees or the Yovel cycle. And so uh, Barry Miller, one of um, my good friends, him and his wife, that, that he wrote a book called Know the Time, Change Your World, and he calls these cycles like the, the rhythms, the rhymes and rhythms of Adonai, and I love that term because we do want to get in his rhyme and in his rhythm. And it might be a little overwhelming at first, but all you have to do is just take that little baby step. We're not looking for absolute perfection in any of these festivals. Every single year and every single week and month with, on his cycles, I learn more. I learn more. And things get easier as you start walking, just like with that child, just learning to walk. We fall down, but then we continue to get back up. And the more we do that, the stronger, the stronger they, those spiritual, spiritual muscles become. So Adonai actually governs through his calendar and clock, you know, when we celebrate, when we eat, when we work, when we gather together. And so they mark our important anniversaries that he wants us to recall and remember, remember. but they also point to future prophetic things. And just by walking it out and trying, he gives us just new insight all the time. So I encourage you to just keep pushing forward. So there's an authority aspect in these 
luminaries of the fourth day of creation. And one of the primary things that they do is keep track of the Moedim festivals, particularly the moons. And so it enables us to go to those rehearsals and anniversaries and appointments and learn more and more and more about what the, the will of the creator. So that moon's light is lesser than the sun's light, but it's also a beacon for those in darkness. And we all at one time were in darkness, maybe we're just in darkness in one area. And the moon is actually a parable showing us that Adonai always does provide light in the darkness. And it might seem to wax and wane, but there's a lesson in that for us too, because we do that. Even in our faith, sometimes we're waxing and waning. But one of the neatest things about the moon, and I know that we have a, a, mostly women here because this is a women's summit, is our correlation as females with the moon. We all have a lunar cycle, a monthly cycle that we go through. And even if you're, you're past that in, in, in menopause, your body is still going through this cycle. So it's like he's aligned women, particularly with the moon, to teach, you know, deeper spiritual truths. Just with that physical lesson, we learn spiritual truths. And in the homes, many and uh, most women are the managers of their home. And you generally are the one that orchestrates and keeps the family's calendar. You're the one that keeps all those things rolling and moving and getting people and children and where they need to be. And, you know, we have dinner with this, this, this family, whatever you're doing, you are the one that is keeping control of that calendar. It's not that your husband doesn't participate. He does, but you are the one that's usually reminding, reminding about the things that are coming because you are definitely associated with time in a very unique way. And your body actually mirrors this. And it's your husband, like with your cycle, with your lunar cycle, he has to look to you when you're in that process of nida, that time of separation, and then that time of coming back together. So we need one another in, in this aspect, but you, as a woman, you're the primary one when it comes to this calendar and the moon. And for that reason, in Judaism, the new moon festivals and, and, and celebrations to this day are usually appointed mostly to women. It's not that the men don't recognize it, they do but it's often women that get together as groups. Some of them even keep it as a, a sort of a, a Shabbat where they don't do their normal activities because it is devoted solely to that communion with the, with the, uh, the Heavenly Father. So um, like the moon, women are often viewed as a lesser light compared to men. And we know that that's not true. Both the sun and moon are vitally important. I think we misunderstand this in many cases, and it has been true throughout the centuries, but I think Adonai is really bringing these together as, as one in restoration. But like that moon, you are typically the entry point into your home. You're the gatekeeper to Adonai's house, to your house, to covenant. Um, the immature usually come in um, often through women and it's because you have that you're like that beacon that moon that light and the darkness and hopefully you're operating with those attributes of the Holy Spirit that are a comforter and a nurturer and you operate in a spirit more of a chesed of loving kindness and are patient in the training of the immature like children we know that the women are heavily involved, uh, involved with the gospel. In Psalm 68, 11, it says, the Lord gives the command, the women who proclaim the good tidings, that's good news, are a great host. And while you might be more hidden, like the moon is, your role is absolutely vital. As I mentioned earlier, it is about being that light in the darkness. Because those that reside in darkness are drawn to the oil lamps of these virgins. And men can operate in this just as well. They can definitely be a wise virgin like I have here on the screen. But a wise virgin will have her lamp full of the oil and the light of those seven spirits of Adonai. You can read about those in Isaiah 11, 1 and 2. Uh, but they are a lesser light 
that testifies of the greater light of Messiah. So in some ways, the moon can be looked at as a parable for all Israel. Doesn't matter if you're Jew or Gentile, all Israel, that whole house, that, that's like a testimony of his greater light. And we're constantly pointing people to the light so that they also become beacons and reflect the light just like the moon does. So the moon's duty is to set boundaries for the months, to keep in guard the Moedim, that's the festivals, the, the feast days. It warns of things to come. Remember, there's those signs that are in the heavenly, and it reflects the light of the sun. So this is our goal as well on a spiritual level. We do all those things as well. So now I'm going to give you just a brief history. I'm not going to go into great detail. There's actually not a lot of scripture about the new moon. So you could, in one sitting, actually just pull it up and look at, look at everything involved with the moon. And even though there's not a lot of information, what's fascinating about the new moon is in many places, it is juxtaposed with the Shabbat. So there is great significance in it, even though there's hiddenness involved. In Numbers 10.10, 10, it says, In the day of your gladness and in the, uh, your appointed feast, and on the first days of your months, you shall blow the trumpets over your burnt offerings and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings. And they shall be as a reminder of you before your God. I am Adonai, your God. So when we come together, and we might not have physical burnt offerings, obviously, without a temple, but we can offer the bulls of our lips in prayer. And that is what we do here in our local new men's groups, is we do that. And we blow those shofar, and we fully believe and trust that this scripture is still true today, that these things are a reminder of us before are gone and we have many testimonies of answered prayers that have come from our new moon meetings so i encourage you even if you're alone or you're doing zoom or you're doing family gatherings or women's gatherings whatever you're doing that you are just as intentional about these new moons as you are about the shabbat and the feast days so the primary word for new moon is kodesh you can see that's just strong sound there. You can see it's a het dalid sheen. But our Western calendar is solar based. And this gets so confusing um, because our calendar is so different than the Hebrew calendar. Isha, can I ask a question really quick? On our sure. microphones, we're hearing a maybe there's a bouncing or something around your microphone. Uh, okay. You know what? Maybe I need to take my necklace off. That might oh, be it. Now we hear you perfect. Oh, yeah, that's probably what it was. It sounded like cutting paper, and we were like, oh, no, we can't hear you. So, oh, you should have told me sooner. Well, I thought it was the cat licking your microphone or something. So I thought, oh, it'll be done in a second. And then I thought, now, oh, no, we have too much to hear. We got 50. We got a lot of time here. We need to get all of this. It's good. That's funny. Right, well, Carmen, I'm tangled. I'm tangled up. Let me get untangled. Carmen says, yeah, me too. I, it was cat, thought it was cat licks. People were saying, I thought it was, um, someone was cutting, but I thought you, you were the only person with a mic. So I thought it has to be yours. So it is mine. I'm sorry. Is that way better? Oh, a hundred percent better. Okay. I'm muting. Okay. Carry on. Okay. Yes. All right. Sorry about that. Um, I wasn't even, I shouldn't even put a necklace on. So our Western calendar, it's solar based. And we know that the sun, you know, fixes the timing of the months or the moons, which it's not really related to the, the moon. Our calendar isn't these days. And the Hebrew calendar is not a lunar calendar. The Muslim calendar is a lunar calendar, but the Hebrew calendar is both lunar and solar based. Each of those, uh, the lesser and the greater light are recognized in the keeping of that calendar. And there are a lot of things, we could just do a teaching just about the calendar because I know there are lots of controversy out there about, you know, even the, even the new moon, how, when it actually is, or um, people have developed, you know, and searched and, and they have their own calendars. I, this message is not about which calendar to keep. I actually follow the Jewish calendar and I have many reasons why, and if we, if any of you wanted to do something 
uh, at another time and talk about that. We could actually talk about that and I would be happy to do so. But it's lunar solar based, the Hebrew calendar is. And that is to keep the seasons in check because if it were solely lunar, the, the festival days would get off because you know the, the cycle of the months does not match those uh, that solar cycle perfectly. And that's why there's an additional leap month on the Hebrew calendar uh, that occurs seven times in a 19 year cycle. And so sometimes if you're wondering, why is this a, a leap year? And we have this, another Adar in the month. We can, we can look at why that goes on perhaps in a different teaching. But for now, let's just think about what the Hebrew calendar actually is. It consults the moon. It's definitely based on the moon. The months definitely start with the new moon, but the sun is also consulted so that those seasons stay in balance. For example, the first month of the year in Nisan or the month of Aviv, that Aviv means green and spring. It must occur in the spring. And so we know that there's a, there's a balance on that calendar. The spring feast shall remain in the spring and those fall feasts shall remain in the fall. But if we're just looking at this basic word, Chodesh, it means new moon, but it also means month. And sometimes you have to look at the context of the scripture that you're reading to determine if it's actually that first of the month, that new moon, or if it's just speaking about the whole month in general. But according to uh, Judaism, and we have lots of, ancient documents, including the Mishnah, that talks about when the new moon is. If you have a regular Gregorian calendar, our normal Western calendar, and you're looking and it says new moon, what that is pointing to is what you see on the, your left-hand screen. It's the astronomical new moon. It is the dark moon. But if you have a Hebrew calendar, when it's showing you the new moon, it's showing you when that first crescent of light of the new moon is actually showing and there's ambiguity there because sometimes you it might be there but we have clouds that are blocking it and that sort of thing but there is a calculated jewish calendar right now again different teaching we could do in later but in ancient times that crescent had to be witnessed and they would go before the sanhedrin if they had seen the moon and they would interview these witnesses they had pictures of you know what the crescent would have looked like for it to be determined. And once it was determined, it was announced and sanctified. And when they did that, then they lit those pyres, fires on top of the mountain. Now that picture actually comes from the Lord of the Rings. <laughs> it's the only one I can find that actually shows this, but they would start that pyre on the Mount of Olives and then it would be seen. And then it, and the next mountain would then they'd light theirs. And so everyone around um, the, the kingdom would then know that the new moon or the new month had began. So with the months, there's a different calculation with them than there is with the um, year. And that's, again, we would talk about that in a, in a calendar teaching. But in, when they left Egypt, when he brought them out and saved them and delivered them and rescued them and brought them through the Reed Sea and brought them through that bloody Passover door, he told them in Exodus 12, this month, speaking of the month of Nisan or the month of Aviv, shall be the beginning of months for you. It is to be the first month of the year to you. It doesn't say it's the beginning of the year. It says it's the beginning of the months. Therefore, there is a count for the months and there is a count for the years. We just actually crossed over from year 5780 to 5781 on the Jewish calendar. And the count of the years begins in that seventh month. And there's many scriptures that talk about the month, the seventh month or Tishrei being the turn of the year. But the beginning of the months is definitely there in the spring, in the month that we celebrate Passover. So it is the head. It is the Rosh of the months. But on a deeper spiritual level, it's the beginning of our walk. It mirrors really. Well, let's think about this. You were born. Physically, you were born through blood and water, through your mother's womb. And you count that time and you are counting your years of life. But hopefully there was a point in your life where you were also born again, where you were born anew. And there's a new count. And most of you could count that 
as well. That would be more like your beginning of months. So there's a being born and being born again. And I think it's fascinating that on the Jewish calendar that Adonai has this in his cycle. There's you being born, creation, and like that seventh month, but then there's a born again cycle with the spring and with like Passover. So if you attend synagogue or, um, or, or attend a Jewish assembly that maybe uses the prayer book or the Siddur, on the Shabbat previous to Rosh Kodesh or the new moon, there's a prayer in the synagogue called the Birkat HaKodesh, the blessing of the new month. And they call this the Malad. And the Malad is the exact timing. They will announce the exact timing of when that new moon will occur. But Malad actually means to birth or to be born. And it comes from the Hebrew word Yalad that means to beget, to give birth, to be born. So you can see all this new birth language just associated with the moon. So strictly speaking, the Malad is that conjunction. That's the dark moon. But the first sliver of light is the actual new moon or the new month because it is the indication. It's like the head crowning, like through that birth of being born. Now there's a blessing that is actually said in that service, that prayer service, that mirrors this, this birthing aspect. And it says, praised are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who created the skies with his word and all the heavens host with the breath of his mouth. He gave them appointed times and they never miss their cues doing their creator's bidding with gladness and joy. He is the true creator who acts faithfully and he has told the moon to renew itself. And remember we're like that parable of the moon and they understand that there's a renewal that we need to go through. It is a beautiful crown for the people carried by God from birth who will likewise be renewed in the future in order to proclaim the beauty of their creator for his glorious majesty. Praised are you, O Lord, who renews the new moons. I just thought that was so beautiful, the language there. So the new moon is about our future redemption. And the message of the moon is you must be born again. And in my little booklet, I mentioned that over and over and over again, that that is really the message of this new moon um, and why it's important for us to keep it. Because one day it shall come to pass that one from one new moon to another and one from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. That's Isaiah 66, 23. Another thing that's interesting in Jewish tradition is that many of the Orthodox keep that dark moon conjunction right before that first sliver is um, able to be seen, they keep it as a Yom Kippur Katan, which just means a little Yom Kippur, and they fast. It's like a little day of atonement. And so when that new moon does arrive, um, they've already had time where they have repented. They've looked back on that previous month. And as that old moon dies, they're looking at it as themselves dying. That's what the fasting represents and that them being born again or renewed at that uh, new moon. So we have lots of spiritual things with the moon. They depict a spiritual womb and birth because remember a womb is a dark, watery place where life grows and that um, enables an eventual birth or rebirth if we're thinking about the moon. The moon affects the tides, the water. Again, you can see the, the womb aspect of that, the waters. It gives light in the darkness. It waxes and wanes. So even in the phases of the moon, you can see death, burial, resurrection. Uh, it also is tied directly in to the fertility cycles of women depending on where you are and what phase you're in depends on whether you are fertile or not. And it follows a monthly cycle, just like that moon. And of course, we also know it gives signs to the earth. We see eclipses, we see blood moons and, and things of that nature. But it also emphasizes what's concealed or hidden and then revealed. 
And, you know, our Adonai is constantly doing that. Things are hidden and concealed, and then he is the re revealer. He gives us revelation. And the moon, again, is a parable of that. And it's a metaphorical picture of Israel, Adonai's wife. It's a picture of the body. It's a picture of us. So there are other moon words, and we're going to look at just a few of them. We could actually go into great detail with any of these. Let me see my time here. Okay. Uh, one of them is Yawak. It's like Kodesh. It can mean both a moon or like a, a whole month, or it can even mean a new moon. But this word, if you look at it, it has that Yod, Resh, Chet. It's related to the word for spirit and wind, Ruach. And the Ruach is associated with movement, just like the spirit of God when we're when we first encounter the spirit of God in Genesis, right at that, the first day of creation, you have the spirit moving, hovering, fluttering over those dark waters of creation. And so the moon itself also is associated with movement. It moves throughout the sky. And there's a place in the scripture, I quoted this in my book. I don't remember where it is, but it talks about the moon walking. <laughs> and I love that. You know, it is, it is the word halak um, it, because it does walk across the sky, but it also reminded me of, um, you know, Michael Jackson doing the moonwalk. And when I was a kid, I thought that was so cool, but there is movement involved with the moon. Another uh, lesser known moon word is Jericho, like the city, uh, Jericho. It is literally means the moon city. And likely the inhabitants there were moon worshipers. So they served the moon rather than letting the moon serve them. And, and there's a stark difference between those two things. But it is fascinating that this is the place in the plains of Jericho that Israel, that new generation, when they left the wilderness, they crossed the Jordan, was circumcised, and celebrated their first Passover right in the plains of the moon city. And so all of those are symbols of covenant and crossing over and being born again. And then there's another term, Levana. This is like the word, the feminine form of, of Laban or Lavan, Lavan. It means white. And it's a more poetic name for the moon, but you will see this term used in the scripture. And it alludes, of course, to the bright whiteness uh, of that light of the moon. So you can see the righteous pictured there. But, you know, there is also a false light. This is a contronym. The moon is also a contronym. So you can also see it's related to a false light, a false witness, like we would see in Levan. And with Israel, who built the house of Israel? The daughters of Levan. We know that Jacob married, of course, Rachel and Leah. And out of those two, Rachel particularly stands out when it comes to the moon because she used her lunar cycle, her separation time, her nida, to deceive her father when he searched for the idols that she stole from him. And we, that could be a whole teaching in itself going into that. But more interestingly is when Joseph had his dreams, Though especially that one of the sun, moon, and the stars, Rachel in that dream was symbol symbolically the moon. So we see two faces of the moon. There's one that depicts idolatry, high places, and then there's a true one. On the other side, we see that it, it's the governor of the Moedim and that light in the darkness. And it's up to us to make sure we discern between those two things. All right, let me see our time. Good, we should be able to do this. Okay, in the second half of my book, The Biblical New Moon, uh, I, have, I go through each one of the Hebrew months and you'll see something similar to this. Actually, there's more in these slides than I have in my book because I just didn't want it to be overwhelming because it was for beginners. But I, I have bullet points with traits that are associated with the month, each one. And so we're gonna look at this. I know there's a lot on this slide, but we're looking at the eighth month that's about to come up. Actually, I think it's Sunday night, um, this Sunday night um, for Heshvan, the eighth month. But it's called Heshvan, or it's also called Bul, which means rain, increase, produce, quiet. We're going to look at that 
in a little bit more detail here in just a minute. And the rabbis have assigned tribes for the months. There's different lists, but the most common one is the one that you will see on your cheat sheet for the months in that, the notes that I gave you. And, you know, there are 12 or 13 tribes, depending on how you look at Joseph. If you um, break Joseph, if you remove him from that list and you put his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh or Manasseh in there, then there are 13. Well, remember on that Hebrew calendar, there's sometimes 12 and sometimes 13 months. And they've assigned them throughout the year. Now, the most common chart that is used is not the birth order of the sons. It is how they encamped around the tabernacle. So remember, there was tribal heads, four tribal heads, and two with each one. So when you're looking at the months, it's going to begin with Nisan or Aviv, and it's going to be that first camp, which with the tribal head of Judah. So Judah is assigned to that first month, and then it follows his two companions, and it goes around the tabernacle. And so in this way, they're seeing them in camp. Now think about the heavenlies reflecting this, you know, with the, with the sun being a picture of the presence of Adonai, and they're in camp all around that tabernacle. So when they would go out, and the, when the cloud moved, and they followed the cloud, or if they went out to war, this is the way in which they marched. Remember that moon walking throughout the year? You can look at that as a picture of us being those tribes walking and moving throughout the year. So by the time we get to the seventh, I'm sorry, the eighth month, our tribe is Manasseh or Manasseh. And if we look in to his birth, remember Joseph, he um, had his two sons while he was still in Egypt. And so you can read about that in Genesis and his name means to cause to forget. Again, we're gonna look at that a little bit deeper. But one of the things that I have in the book, and I debated on putting this in there because I know it um, can be controversial, especially if people don't understand, is the mazel. That is the constellation that is in the sky. This is not astrology. It is not divination. And it has nothing to do with your future or whether you should, you know, call your boyfriend or buy a car or ask for a promotion. That's not what these are about. They are actually those constellations that follow the same ecliptic in the sky, that little imaginary line that the sun and moon follow. And they're in the sky at this season and they have a divine purpose, not so that you serve them. They serve us and they proclaim a message. We're going to look at the scripture for that. And it is not about divination. It is about the good news, the gospel. They proclaim the good news. And in Hebrew right now, that constellation that's coming up in the sky is the Akrav, which is the scorpion, or sometimes you'll see it as the Scorpio. And we're going to look at that. Another point that I put in there is the feast, both traditional and, of course, the ones that are in the the biblical feast of like Leviticus 23 and Heshvan has done. And we're going to look, we're going to think about maybe why they don't. And there's themes associated with this month in Judaism. It's associated with the month for Messiah. Uh, it commemorates Noah's flood. It uh, remembers the death of our, our mother, Emma Raquel, Rachel. It has to do with transition because we're leaving one season and moving into another. And there's an, um, a sense, remember how the tribes are people and they represent sort of that moon following Adonai? Well, the rabbis also associate a sense. And I know we only have five human senses and, and they add to that just normal things uh, uh, like uh, walking and primary um, things that humans do and they associate those with the month and, and one of those is smell and we're going to uh, for the eighth month and we're going to look at that and then there's also Hebrew letters associated with this one in this month it is the letter noon and I'm not going to go into great detail uh, with that but there are 12 particular letters that they use I have some uh, I think teaching elsewhere on that but one of the biggest things if you don't look at anything else is look at the Torah portions that fall within the month. 
because as you follow those Torah portions, those portions follow you, or so it seems. <laughs> and so they will give you divine insight in how to walk up the month. We think about this through the week, but then broaden that circle, make another one, make another will within the will here, and think about how all four of them come together and speak a message, a greater message about that month. So what we're seeing that's coming up in Heshvan is the portions Noach, Leklaka, Vayira, and Haye Sarah. And so there's neat things to learn about them. So with the mazel, the constellations, or with um, the sun or moon, I love Psalm, one, uh, Psalm 19. It's a great Psalm. I encourage you to read the whole thing because it's comparing these things in parallel form to the Torah of Adonai and how wonderful it is. But it says, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day into day utters speech and night into night reveals knowledge. So there's day into day, there is like a wordless voice that these heavenly luminaries declare to us. And night into night, when we're seeing those stars and when we're seeing the moon, that light in the darkness, there is a revelation of knowledge, intimacy with the Lord that comes from that. And the Psalm goes on to say, there is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. It is a constant witness to all of creation. With those points for the months, one of the things I always do is just look at the number because remember the months actually are just numbers, just like the weekdays aside from Shabbat. And this one is eight. And I know you guys probably know a lot about eight already. The first thing that jumps to our mind, of course, is new beginnings. And this is a new cycle. We just had the turn of the year. And so eight actually moves us beyond seven. It's about not just being complete, but completely satiated. It has to do with becoming fat, having more than enough, full to overflowing. That's where we should find ourselves, but it's also where we're gonna be tested. Uh, there's always testing that goes on. So it's a, gonna be a challenge to this fullness that we've received in the seventh month with all the fall Moedim. So it moves us from the natural to the supernatural. And so when we think about the number eight, we might also think about Noah. Remember, that's one of our tour portions. And we know that there were eight souls that were spared in the flood. We know that circumcision, the sign of the covenant, the place where the seed passes through, that occurs on the eighth day. And we know that David, that figure of the Messiah and King, he was the eighth son of his father. And that's just a few things. There's many more things we could look with eight. But when I think about the eighth month, and when you think about the eighth month, you can maybe even do a concordance search on eight and see if you can find common themes that are involved here. And it will kind of give us um, prayer points for the month, but it will also then uh, show up, you know, when you pay attention to something, like for example, if you bought a red car, you might see red cars everywhere. Well, I think that the, our brains are wired that way with intention. It's because if we are looking and diligently searching, then Adonai does reveal things to us that were concealed. Sometimes you will see Heshvan called Mar Heshvan. And Mar means bitter. And you're like, why would there be bitterness associated with the eighth month? Um, they have several explanations for this. Some of them say that we have been on such a spiritual high in the seventh month that often people experience a low in the eighth month even though that's not what we should experience, it's sort of human nature maybe to do so. So we need to recognize that we might have to deal with some of that and know where it's coming from. 
Uh, some people, you know, sense or expect judgment rather than blessings. Um, there's a bitterness maybe of not having any special uh, feast days, whether they are biblical or traditional. But we're also experiencing a transition. There is less light, daylight. And as those days begin to grow shorter, some people deal with depression. But my question is, and I ask myself these same things, what does Adonai want me to see in the eighth month? I, and I believe the biggest thing is transition and expectation and warning not to fall into despair, not to um, grow weary in well-doing. And we'll, we'll look at some of the reasons why. But in Israel, remember at the end of Sukkot, the prayers for rain begin. And there's a reason for that because on their cycle, it's not the first fall month, Tishrei, where the, the weather really makes the transition. It is in the eighth month. Um, you know, they're more temperate climate. And so they start seeing a, the change of the season occur more in the eighth month. And that is when it goes from the hot, dry summer into the time of rain. And so in our story, in one of our, our first tour portion for the month, we're going to read about rain. We're going to read about rain coming and we're going to read about the great depths of opening. So you're seeing water coming from above and water coming from below in, in this Torah portion and in the eighth month. Because if there were, um, if the months and years were originally calculated from the same point, and I believe they were, and the, the sages actually agree with that, then Adonai wouldn't have had a reason to say, now is the beginning of, of months for you in the spring. And if that's true, when we're reading that story of Heshvan, rather than being um, the eighth month, Heshvan would have been the second month on that accounting before, of course, that exodus from Egypt. And if so, then that flood began on the 17th of Heshvan. It would have been at this time. And of course, it ended with the land being dry the following year on the 27th. So we see Noah's story actually plays um, a great deal into our month. Because at that head, and that would be really around that first tour portion, the head contains everything for the month. So when I look at these points and I look at these tour portions, I see that being, you know, like that governing aspect for the entire month. And I believe that plays out very, very true in Heshvan, as you can see in the eighth month. Now, one of the uh, titles that the sages give for Heshvan is the month for Messiah. So if we're looking in 1 Kings 8, we see that the temple was completed, but they did in the eighth month. Okay, you can read about that in 1 Kings 8. But they chose not to dedicate it until the following year in Tishrei at Sukkot. But since it was actually completed, and I want you to think about the house, I want you to think about the temple, I want you to think about the body, the, the whole body coming together. They say that since it was actually completed in the eighth month and yet not dedicated, the tradition says that Heshvan is reserved for the time of Mashiach, for Messiah, who, when, who will inaugurate the third temple during that month. And this is why there are no holidays in it, traditional or biblical, because this month is reserved for him. And I just love that. And I can totally see the tying in with the eight with him on that. Now back to the rain. Remember the turn of the year, not the months, is in that in the fall with Tishrei. So when you read about the early and the latter rains, the early rains occur beginning really in Heshvan. Those are the early rains they're, because they're the early part of the year. So they occur right after Sukkot. The latter rains occur in the spring just before Passover. Now, if we're thinking about the monthly cycle, that doesn't seem to make sense. But if you think about the yearly cycle, it makes perfect sense that the early rains are in the early part of the year and the latter rains would occur then later. But the name of those early rains are Yoray. And of course, they are 
crucial to the agricultural cycle in Israel, especially after that dry, hot summer. summer. They are what's gonna break up the ground to soften it so that the seeds can be sown in the fields. And yore comes from the root yara, which many of you will be familiar with. It means to shoot, to cast, or to teach. It's like the picture of an arrow being shot through a bow. That's the same root for the word Torah, the instructions of Adonai. In Deuteronomy 32.2, Moses says, may my teaching drop as the rain, my speech distill as the dew, like gentle rain upon the tender grass and like showers upon the herbs. You can see how teaching is associated with rain because clouds are in the heavenlies and they are the ones that have that heavenly water that gently rains upon the earth and enables things to grow. And that's what Adonai's Torah is meant to do in us. So with our trop, and I'm sorry, I'm just kind of going from point to point on this. This is about the only way to really do it. Manasseh or Manashe means to cause to forget. If you'll recall, that's what Joseph said when his firstborn son was born to him in Egypt, that Adonai has caused me to forget all the toil in my father's house. So there's um, a graphic there you see on your screen, and it's simply a clock that I overlaid the months on. And I love this because I love pictures because they help me to, to learn and connect new things. But I want you to look where Heshvan is. It's on the eight and look directly across from that. And it's mirror month would be ER, the second month. And, these, and you can do that with each one of the months. As a matter of fact, the, the rabbis do this all the time. Because in the year, you really have a light cycle and a dark cycle. The light cycle would be like the spring, beginning with Passover, moving in through all that fall feast season. There's more light. But in the dark part of the year, then we see that there is lesser light yet they're still light in the darkness. Remember, we have those moon and stars, but they see them as like a mirror reflection or a chiastic structure. So when we look at that little clock, we can see that Heshvan is going to have aspects of the second month. And ER doesn't have any uh, major feast days, but every single day, there's the counting of the Omer. So you can see where Heshvan doesn't have any of that. On the opposite side, you have a commandment, a special one that is kept every single day. So when we look at Manashe, the tribe mirror there is Issachar and his uh, name means to hire. There's wages, there's reward. So what does Adonai though want us to forget? It's certainly not Issachar. He wants us to remember our wages and reward. What do you think he might want us to forget? And I believe that is all the toil, because that's something that we are all doing. One day, he will wipe every tear from our eye. And to me, that links it right back to that month of Messiah and, and his coming. So if we're looking at the constellation, the mazel that's in the eighth month, that word is akrav, and it derives from the word akev, which means heal. You might recall when uh, Jacob and Esau were born and he was clutching onto the hill of his brother Esau and his name Yaakov actually means the hill catcher. He was, is rooted in that same word, a kev. But with scorpions or Scorpio, you can see how they all, like a serpent, they, they strike the hill. So in your homework, on that sheet, I actually asked you to do a concordance search on scorpions and to see if you can find a common theme. Deuteronomy 8, 15 says, he led you through the great and terrible wit, uh, wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground where there was no water. He brought you, what he brought water for you out of a, the rock of Flint. Um, there's, uh, I don't know if I put this in here. Yeah, I did. Okay, good. 
Revelation 9.10 associates scorpions with tormentors, but also scorpions are associated with rebellion. And I believe anytime we move out of a big season like Tishrei, that, and especially in a transition of the year where you're moving into like this, this darker um, time of the year, this, this transition, this cycle, that there's things that we have to deal with. And one of them that we have to be really wary about is rebellion. So when I'm looking at that scorpion and I'm thinking, what does he, the Lord want me to learn from this in this month? It might be that I have to deal with scorpions on the outside. It might be me that has the issues with where I'm uh, behaving like a scorpion and I shouldn't be. But let's look at Ezekiel. This is his call, the call on his life, because Adonai is going to send him to a rebellious people. And even if they don't listen, he's still supposed to deliver that word. And it says in you, son of man, be not afraid of them, nor be afraid of their words. Though briars and thorns are with you and you sit on scorpions. Does that mean he's literally sitting on scorpions? I don't think so. I think this has a deeper spiritual implication. He says, be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks for they are a rebellious house. So you can see that these scorpions are associated with rebellion and it's not the scorpions, it's people. And we need to check first that we're not this scorpion. In the Targum, it paraphrases this Ezekiel passage, thou dwellest in the midst of a people whose works are like to scorpions. And scorpions strike the hill and they bring great pain and discomfort. They are like little, little tormentors. But we also see scorpions associated with oppressive leaders. In 1 Kings 12, 11, this is Solomon's son, Rehoboam. And this, and you know, he took counsel with his young leadership, uh, bad counsel actually. And he came to the people and says, whereas my father loaded you with a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips but I will discipline you with scorpions. Now, does that mean that he was literally going to dump scorpions on them? I don't think so. This has to do with being uh, a type of, of torment. And that's what oppressive leadership will do. Uh, that picture you see there is a scorpion native to Israel. It's called the death stalker. And it's one of the most venomous scorpions in the world, which is quite fascinating. We're running out of time. But I wanted you to get an idea because you can do this yourself by looking at these themes. You can do the concordant searches. You can ask Adonai to make connections for you. Um, I get new ones every year. I did make some videos. You can find them on YouTube or at my uh, website, graceandtora.net. There's a menu heading called the new moon. Uh, I did one full cycle. It's been a little while now since I've, I've done that, but you can get um, maybe some, some ideas. And even with the boundary stones document that I gave you, if you don't like that, make your own acronym, <laughs> use it as a template uh, for, for groups. The idea is to keep your space like a womb, a protective place, a safe place for people to mature and to grow. And I know this is, that's the, the hopes um, with the Rooted Cafe and with the portion um, their goal is to do that same thing. And as women, we, sh we have the full capacity to do this if we do not, um, if we're not living in the flesh, because we, we can certainly do that. But if we are following him and our feminine aspect, we can certainly do that. But it, since I've showed you this slide, I'll go ahead and talk about it. How are the little tormentors revealed? <laughs> My in-laws live in Phoenix. And one of the things that my husband and my sons like to do when they go out there is to take a black light. You can buy black light flashlights and go out and find the scorpions because their little exoskeleton actually glows in the UV light. And so I, I love this because to me, it's just like a living parable. You know, these little tormentors are concealed in the darkness. But if you have the right tool, if you have the right light, on that light spectrum. You know, the light spectrum is really big. Our uh, visible light, what we can see, is such a tiny little thing. And so, and UV is one of those that we don't have, but if we have that tool, and I liken that to the Word of God, if we have that, and the Holy Spirit, because both of those are a light that helps us to see these things in the darkness, then they not only 
become visible, but they glow, they glow so that we can avoid them or eradicate them all together. So now I'm going to exit my share screen. And pull you guys back up. Let's see where we are. Hey, you, I have a couple, we just have a couple questions. One of them, um, a lot of people have asked if it would be possible for us to get your PowerPoints, if you have those available, yes. if you would be shared those. Great. So I will, I have asked if they would just, at the end of the day, any of the PowerPoints or anything you want, if you would just send an email to info at the rootedcafe.com and myself or Sydney, will make sure we get those to you as soon as we receive them. It won't be something you get today, but it would be uh, probably by Monday, we would get those out to you. And then someone, uh, Petra has asked, how would you mind sharing how you practically celebrate a new moon day or night? And also, can you click my name and make me host again? Yes, let me do that first because where am I going to find you at? Okay. You should be under <laughs> like, where are you? Oh, there you are. There you are. Okay, I see you. Make host. Change works. Did that work? Yep, I think so. Let me see. see. Oh, yeah, there you are. Okay, okay. yes. Yeah, so she wants okay. some practical because I think that's the one thing yes. that even in, in myself yeah. is that we really want to focus on how do we do walk this out practically? I mean, I love knowing the why. Yeah. Okay, that's really what my new moon book is uh, about as well. But very simply, there's not just a, a hard and fast thing for this. Um, what, I'll tell you what we do, and, I'll, and that'd probably give you the best idea. Here, we mostly do our new, me, new moon meetings as a gathering of women. If the new moon falls around Shabbat, we will do families. Uh, we encourage daughters to also join us. Um, and the reason why we mostly do it with women is because of the intense prayer. A lot of that prayer is for our husbands and our children. Um, not that men can't be great intercessors, but when we do it with the families, the prayer usually doesn't last as long. And that there's, it's just, women are often uh, ready to press in a little more. But what we do is we have house gatherings for our new moon. If you had a fellowship, of course, you in a building, you could certainly uh, orchestrate that. Get with the leadership and say, let's do this as a group or as women, however you want to do it. But we do eat, we bring, you know, snacky foods and things like that. And that's how we usually start it with, with some fellowship. And we're usually eager to, to see one another. We encourage people to bring their shofars um, because we will try to cite that new moon if the weather en enables us to. And we go out and we blow those shofars and we pronounce a blessing. But we do focus on worship and prayer. Sometimes we'll do a little bit of teaching just general about the month. But that focus is worship. And generally before prayer, we will start with worship because, you know, it just sets that atmosphere for prayer. And maybe you have a prayer list with your, with your congregation or with uh, online communities. And I know I always have an ongoing prayer list for people. Go through those prayers. Seek him. Ask him what he would have you do for the month. Um, if, if the weather is good, like what we're going to do for Heshbon this year, because it is fall, we've got some cool weather, the, the woman that's hosting at her home, and that's what we do. We have a private Facebook group that connects us all together. We uh, go from house to house. We'll have different women that ask to host certain months, and we, we do that. They put up their address. Sometimes we'll say, I'm bringing this. What are you bringing? We'll set the time, and we do often start in the daylight. But if you're wanting to sight the new moon, it occurs in that western sky right where the sun is setting and it's popping up right near that sunset and it will go down quickly. So if you're wanting to actually sight it, it needs to be around that time. It needs to be in the evening and the seasons do um, make a difference on that. There are apps that you can get uh, about the moon. There's one, I think it's called Skywalker, where you can actually hold your phone up and see where everything is. <laughs> the constellations, satellites, moon, the moon, sun, wherever it is, and where you can find it in, in that sky. But that's where you're going to see it. In the, if you live in the northern hemisphere, that new moon sliver is always going to be on the right side. That's where you're going to see it. If you happen to look up in the sky and you see a sliver and it's on the left-hand side and you're in the northern hemisphere, then you are actually seeing the waning moon. It is getting, it's about to go into the dark phase, but uh, which would be the conjunction. 
but if it's on that right side, then it is, it is the new moon. And we are not adamant about it being directly on some certain date. We play with the dates. You know, there's used, uh, often there's two new moon dates there that we play with. And the one that most people can attend, that's the one that we choose um, to, to gather together. Let's say it's really, if we could do it Sunday night or we could do it Monday night, then, you know, we chose to do it Sunday night, that first day of the new moon for Heshvan. Did that answer? Did that help some? I'm not hearing you. Are you talking? I don't hear you. Hmm. Can you guys hear Charlie? No, she says no. We still can't hear you. Okay. While well, she's figuring out that sound, now. let me see. If can... Oh, yep. I can hear you. So it's a technical thing when you turn yourself off because you're <laughs> when you mute yourself. <laughs> I, I I have to potty, so I was probably sitting here like jiggling. <laughs> So um, I have to be the crazy one because that's when I first heard the process of celebrating the new moon, I had these pictures of women in white flowy dresses with, with flowers around their heads, dancing around a campfire. And it was like the Yaya secret sisterhood and they were all dancing and doing the dances. And I was like, Oh no, what kind of crazy are we getting into? Like, who are these ladies? You know? And I, yeah, I know. I mean, I'm the new, I always am going to take the spot of the newbie here, uh, 20 years into this, never celebrated a new moon and I'm super excited to do it now, but what a beautiful time. And you know, the thing you talked about just having women get together and doing this. And even if you have a combined group, I think that the intensity of the prayer is very intimate. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's a safe, it's a safe thing to have not be combined, you know, with people necessarily Yes. It's having the women praying together because you're travailing it sometimes for things. And as you're yes, praying things absolutely. in, and it gets very personal and intimate. Um, uh, Holly has asked, how does she get your stuff? Uh, you can grace and Torah.net or on Amazon. Her books are also, also on Amazon. Mm -hmm. um, Petra saying, thank you. It's so great. Um, my heart, Kathy M says, my heart can barely, can barely contain the joy from all the truth that I'm receiving. We have a couple people with your hands up. I'm going to see if, let's get crazy. Trisha, I'm going to try it. I'm going to allow you to talk. Do you have a question you want to answer? Ask, not answer, I guess. You have to unmute yourself. No, thank you. Oh, okay. And then I had another hand up. Uh, I'm going to ask, it, it, this person still signed on as me. So uh, if you had your hand up, you see, should see a little thing that the host is asking you to unmute. Maybe it was an accident. Okay. The best thing to do is um, ask questions over in the Q&A. What at see? Uh, Rebecca asks, do you include the clock, hands, Hasidic, um, with the month names oh, in your book? Uh, no, actually, Rebecca, the book is, is more basic, but you can find that clock on my website. Um, uh, if you go to the new moon heading, gosh, I have so much there because there's stuff for every month. I'm trying to remember exactly where I have that clock. I could actually email you guys that, uh, in a document if you, if you want that chiastic, uh, clock. Sure. Um, it, it's really helpful to me. I do have it on there somewhere, but I don't know exactly where it is. I can tell you another thing that we do is we light tea lights. We have one and we do that to represent, you know, how they would signify the fire of the new moon, you know, when they on the mountaintops when they would do it. So we often like we have candle lights. Sometimes in the summer we do this and some people will have pools and we'll, we'll be in the swimming pool or um, if it's winter, it's inside. We've been, we've, we've done all kinds of different things for the month. The whole idea is to honor Adonai and one another and remain in a, a, um, a spirit of reverence for him and unity together. And we have had a lot of people come in 
from different walks, like I say, that if they're brave enough to come, at first they're a little weirded out because they're thinking, what is this? Are you worshiping the moon? What are these people doing? <laughs> and once they get there, they understand um, what this, what we're actually doing is what I just said, reverencing him, loving one another, um, no, no doctrinal debates, no pushing or beating people up with tort. We don't do any of those things. We meet them right where they are. Love that. Abigail, do you have a question? Yeah, I just, uh, who's this video thing? What's the thing? That's you. We're asking you, had, you had your hand up for a question. Yeah, uh, how are you, Kesa, how do you write a, a book? Oh, that. <laughs> that would be another seminar. So, <laughs> but thank you. Yeah, well, that's, that would not be something we would answer. We could, we'll, we'll have that. We'll send you to a different seminar. <laughs> that's fun. Anybody else have any other questions? Well, we got it. We got some over here. Oh, I, I, How did I your jour it. journey in this area start, Keisha? Yolanda asked. Well, ac well, actually, I often start with that story. Um, we had been keeping the Torah and the festivals for many years, and we did recognize the moon, not every month. I mean, we understood that its purpose with the Hebrew months, but not, we were never in majorly intentional. Occasionally, maybe we would go, oh, let's go see if we can spot the new moon. Well, what happened was my husband lost his job, and it was right before the fall feast one year, and uh, we were, we were desperate. We was having a very difficult time finding a job, and one night he had a dream that this man came up and told him he would have a job at the new moon. And so uh, when my husband told me this, I'm like, oh, well, who, who tracks time by the moon? It's Adonai. So I immediately ran to the calendar to see when the new moon was, the new, new moon would be. And I was like, oh no, it's almost a month away. We need a job now. <laughs> you know, it's one of those things. And so anyway, long story short, he ended up taking a job that we knew was not the one. And uh, he had previously interviewed for a job that was in Knoxville. That's where I live now. And on the new moon, that guy called him. It had been weeks and told him he was hired. It was on the new moon. So he quit the one, of course, because we, even, we knew it wasn't the one to begin with. And that's what brought me to Knoxville. So when I got here, I was completely intrigued with the moon. I started reading everything, every resource I could on the new moon because I'm like, why did the father choose to work it this way? Why did he draw our attention to that? Why was it the new moon? And so uh, by the time I met the, the groups and the people that are here, uh, I met them through Deborah Flanagan, whom you're going to hear from later. I would just outpouring all this stuff. This is how I got here. You know, what is this all? And she was like, you know, um, well, I was telling her, we really need to be doing more. We need to be intentional. And she was like, well, let's just do it. So that's how our new moon meeting started here. And eventually that led to the book and, and so forth. That's really great. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, do we have a question from Terry saying, is the new moon a Sabbath? Well, there's debate about that, Terry. Um, most, most people do not keep it as a Sabbath. I'm not opposed to keeping it as a Sabbath. I do know it is juxtaposed with the Sabbath. And I also know that in, uh, I think it is in Nehemiah or Nehemiah where they, they did close the gates at Jerusalem and they did not do commerce on the new moons and the Sabbath. So there is ideas in some of the sages speak that one day it will be kept like a Sabbath, but um, that's really a, a personal conviction. If you want to do that, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. That's great. I think it's really not, you know, we're talking about the moons. There's too many things that revolve around the cycle of the moon for us to just ignore it as if it were not a big deal, right? It's, right. it's too much. And, and our friend who asked about where to, how to write a book, she was actually wanting to know how do you, uh, how do you find your book? And so oh. her mom said she would show her. So good. On Amazon, if you just put in, um, probably if you just Google my name and, I mean, put my name in the search on, I only have the one book right now on Amazon, but uh, you can put in the biblical new moon and it's got to be in those first top searches if you do that too. Great. Anything else you want to say? Any final words for us today? We'll let everyone go to lunch. Anyone? Anyone? Uh... 
uh, Laura asks, how would you introduce a new moon celebration to a Shabbat group? Hi, Laura. I know Laura. Um, <laughs> Hi, Laura. Well, <laughs> what I would do um, is I would just bring it to the leadership and, and make a decision. You know, if, if you want to do it as a, a whole body, as a whole group and, and try to initiate that, it would just be something that you could look forward to on the calendar and say, this is the date, set it up as a prayer meeting. Maybe, and, and if you want to incorporate it with like a fellowship, like with an ONEG, sort of like we do, if depending on how much trouble that would be, try to do that. Um, but I don't see any reason why. And if they don't want to do it at the, if you don't have a building, you know, maybe you could set up a group of different people willing to host it. If you, anyone who doesn't know what an ONEG is, it's, uh, it's a, um, I just, I was going to say afterglow. That says how well, how old I am. <laughs> oh, that's just not, coming. it's a potluck. <laughs> I just was going to say afterglow, and for all of you who are uh, over 50, you're laughing like Keisha. Okay. Uh, Keisha, you're not over 50, so what are you laughing about? Not over 50. Close. Yeah. Close but it's to like, 50. But oh, not yes. I just showed my roots right there. Anyways, thank you so much, Keisha. It has been a blessing. I, we're going to get, we will definitely hear more from Keisha in the future. We have been so blessed to have you. I know she'll be sneaking in on the backside to hang out with us, but okay. we sure appreciate you. Any final parting words for us? From you? Oh, from me? <laughs> okay, well, first, I just want to just, I want to bless you if you don't mind. So oh, I'd love it. Abba, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for Charlie and Brenda working so hard to bring this women's summit together, Father. I know there are so many of us that are alone, are in just tiny little pockets, and, and we don't have community, Father, but the truth is we are more connected than ever. We have the opportunity, even if it is through phone lines, Zoom lines, we, we can connect with one another, and we just thank you that you're linking us together and bringing us together, Father. I just pray a spirit of unity to yes. come upon all of us and that we realize that none of us has everything right, but we, our mandate is to love one another, Father. Love one another, just no matter where we are on the journey, Father. Just may we link arms and be strong and may that just grow in the body and spread throughout our nation and Israel and the world, Father. And I just pray that you bless each and every single woman that joins, Father. Um, may she know that you are there and that we are here. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. Amen. Be sure to go stalk Keisha out at Grace and Torah. You can watch her trainings um, on um, YouTube. I clean house to Keisha. So um, I have Keisha going in the background on, on her YouTube channel while I'm cleaning house. And she makes that go quick on the Shabbat, uh, getting ready for Shabbat. So I appreciate you. Have an amazing day. Just be blessed, 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 blessed. Just pray yes. a super blessing on you. Amen. Okay, guys, we are going to...